This video is brought to you by MZ. That's what I was saying, like, I kind of threw myself under the bus a little bit because a lot of times, like, you're thinking about, like, movies like Barry Lyndon and you think, it's like, oh my God, those lenses. I was like, yeah, but those focus bars were <laughs> insane. You know? What's going on, Indie Mogo? My name is Ted. Today I'm here with cinematographer Mihai Malamari. He's an amazing DP that's worked with not only Francis Ford Coppola, but also Paul Thomas Anderson, and most recently just shot the movie Jojo Rabbit. Today we're gonna to talk about the movie from not only the script, but also break through the camera and lenses, talk a little bit about the lighting, and then finally also anything additional as far as stories on production and how it actually went for Mihai. So, ready to do this? Hi. Now, Mihai, uh, how was the experience of actually shooting Jojo Rabbit? It was great. It was awesome. I, it's kind of all that I hoped for, because I knew Taika style. A lot of people are calling it a comedy. I think it's a love story. What I wanna ask first is, what was the general aesthetic? How did you guys arrive at the overall visual style for the film. I watched for some documentaries and that had a lot of color footage from World War II. As soon as I read Taika's script, I thought about it. I was like, oh, you know what? Like that might be an interesting approach. And seeing the sketches from the art department and samples from the costume department, I realized kind of we were all going for the same idea of color saturation. We were so used to black and white and then moving images from that era. Or like that, desaturated, or desaturated blue color. Yeah. But like when, when you watch like restored color footage from World War II, you're like, wait, one second, like everything is vibrant. And this is what the world like, actually yeah, looked like. Yeah. The idea that it's a story of a 10 year old boy who's really fascinated by what's around him. was like, oh yeah, that's that's the way to go. What's the camera that this is being shot on? What lenses did you choose for the project? So we, we chose the Alexa SXT and, and the reason for that, like we knew that we don't want to get into any handheld. We knew we wanted to try 133, 166, 185, 240. So it felt like a really good system to to have for, for all these forms. And the reason is like the Query sensor. If we would have gone with with an LF or a DXL yeah. Panavision, we'd have a 2.0 starting yeah. point. If you start with a with a wider one, which mm -hmm. would be probably like a 2.0, then you have to to crop too much to get to a 133. The idea was that this is very close to 133 to start with, yeah. so you might not need to crop at all. But I heard if you if you use the Airy Frame Composer, mm -hmm. I was like, okay, there is a way to use the 1.3 lenses and start with a more square sensor. And if you do that, you'll get something very close to 1.9, which is very close to 185. Yeah. So you will end up shooting 185 with anamorphic lenses, but without a giant crop. So what visual qualities does this add to the film? There is something to, to the anamorphic lenses that velvety quality to the skin tone. Yeah. And the backgrounds are so amazing, like the bucket and every, everything that is like characteristic to, to anamorphic. So in this scene here, we're looking for really what the quality of the anamorphic lenses in and, this aspect ratio and and you you would see like as soon as you see down the hallway you see what's happening with that background the way it's like falls out of falls focus out and it's like melting and sometimes when you react focus you feel it and like some people don't like that because it's too much but i kind of like it even then it has a certain like cinematic quality to it kind of warping yeah let's start off first with a scene that i think capture that color yeah uh, let's play the clip <laughs> The best way to describe this scene would be that Jojo is coming for his revenge. Gotcha. <laughs> These are the kids at Boy Scouts. He's coming back. He's feeling empowered and ready to change something. Now, lads, each of you will be given the opportunity to ignite and throw a grenade. So again, we were in Prague and I was trying to figure out like, okay, we cannot bring a grip tricks here, but can we make one out of something? And they had something very similar, which was a bare bones golf cart. Yeah. Could take some weight and it worked really well. Like it allowed us to, to do the shot. Talk to me a little bit about the lighting for this scene. This was like an open field with a little bit of a forest. So I remember when we text scouted, we kind of chose it based on where the sun is going. And of course there was almost no sun that yeah. day until it came out and kind of like Changed all your lighting. <laughs> like this shot, the wide shot, it was the first one we did in that location. Now, the more we, we, we went tighter and tighter, like the light was not only changing direction, the sun was in and out of the clouds and then it oh, came out. And it was like, the approach was smart because we started with the, with the wide shots and kind of establishing the look. We're like counting and trying to figure out like, 
watching weather forecast and all that. I noticed that, you know, everyone's extremely kind of soft here too. Is there anything else that you added on top of the radio? For, for this or? one, no. No, no it was that, natural that light. Was, that was pretty much natural light. Maybe some haze, anything else? It, it was, but I think it was, uh, we're trying to be careful with the haze and try to, to add it more in the background. Like we kind of liked what happened after, after we saw the first grenade exploding. Then we decided like we'll add some in the background, but we don't want to do it too much because otherwise it will kind of fight the, the smoke that was coming from the actual explosion. Uh, so to make the smoke more noticeable, you didn't want to add too much yeah, haze into the yeah. scene. A lot of times I will try not to do it. Anamorphic or vintage lenses, they will kind of do the same thing. I tend to use haze only when I really want to see their light beams that yeah. I really need to see, but other than that. I love this shot. This shot is so pretty. <laughs> Symmetry and horizon. <laughs> Symmetry <laughs> and horizons. All right, moving on. Next scene. All righty. Yeah, what's going on in that scene? Uh, it's it's one of those moments between Jojo and his mother. Where it's like a really intimate dinner scene. They have this kind of funny argument about politics. And God damn it! Why does that make you happy? You hate your country that much? I love my country. It's a war I hate. It's pointless and stupid. And the sooner we have peace, the better. Oh, the war will end. We will crush our enemies into dust. And when they are destroyed, we shall use the graves as toilets. Okay, no more politics. Dinner is neutral ground. This table is Switzerland. Let's eat. So, I mean, we this was a, an easy one to, to think about because we knew that they will spend most of the time sitting at the table. We came up with two lighting setups for, mm -hmm. for this. And there's one light that I, I, I love, especially for, for people sitting at the table. It's the, the Chimera pancake. Yeah. And I mean, the advantage of that is that you can put it really flat to the ceiling, but also the quality of, of, of it. It's so much better than like a gimbal or yeah. anything. It was easy. We knew we want to start with a wide shot. So, yeah. and we really had this, this amazing chandelier. We actually had two sky panels S30, mm -hmm. one here and one here, and they were like crisscrossing light. They had uh, chimeras mm -hmm. and egg crates, so they don't spill anywhere else. And what's amazing about, about shooting Alexa is that mm -hmm. you don't need a lot of fill light. All the fill light that was in the scene was pretty much coming from the practicals. And that's because of the dynamic range of that camera just being able and to pull the, in. The, how much it sees in the shadows. Yeah. So if you look at it, you have a harder edge light on both of them in the wide shot. Mm -hmm. When we went into coverage, we turned off all these guys and we came with a chimera really close here yeah. on, on a C-stand. Uh -huh. And if you look at the close-ups, there's a much softer lighting on them, which is nice for, yeah. for a close-up, but you can get you can get away with it. What's interesting about it, like we knew that that's what we, we want to use for the close-ups. So that's when we, we matched our S30s or sky panels to the, to the color temp that yeah. the chimera would give us dim down 50%. Uh, gotcha, because when you dim down these tungsten lights, they generally warm up in color temperature. Yeah, yeah. So they naturally give you that 2800. We did, and of course, because I love Dido lights, we had yeah. also a Dido that yeah. was like right outside of the shot, yeah. just meshing into the, the white cloth of the yeah. table. I think sometimes it was behind the soup. <laughs> <laughs> Behind the soup? Sometimes, yeah, because if you use the optical adapter, like you can... Yeah, you can down. really project it in. And, and what, what that would do, like, uh, it will create some nice highlight when she was looking down a little bit, you know, and for him as well, like it's an extra feel light that you might need. And when it came to composing this scene, how did you approach the composition for it? The main discussion was like, do we want to go over the shoulder? And, and then it felt more intimate to just cut from, from one side to another without being over somebody's yeah. shoulder. My question is, this scene in particular is one where this is a comedy and the, the lighting is, is very cinematic, actually. It's kind of traditionally cinematic. So I think a lot of people and a lot of indie filmmakers here are like, oh, comedy, comedy, comedy. Shoots high key all the time. Yeah, it's flat lighting, yeah. all this stuff. What do you say to that? And how, no, why did you go with this I think approach? It's like, it's, it's, I think if you overdo it, either way, it's not okay. You know, it's like if it's a dinner scene at night, then you can afford to do this and still have the comedy vibe. Like, I mean, like we could have been way darker, but we, we still kept some light on the walls in the background. A lot of times when you go in a real location, I think the best approach would be to either turn on the lights that are there or turn off everything and kind of see how the space looks in 
for real. I think in this wide shot, it really does feel like the light is really just bouncing off of this wall from the mm -hmm. chandelier or maybe from this little light here. And then because the room extends out this way, that's what that fall off of the light comes mm -hmm. from. So it's, it feels motivated it the works. entire time. It works really well. It's, it's a really nice chandelier. And I really liked the fact that the bottom of it was frosted, so. Before we move on though, let's not forget about MZ, the filmmaking educational subscription service that everyone should know about. Now, again, we've been learning a lot in this episode, but there's always more that you can learn about filmmaking and more that you can do with a subscription to MZ Pro. There you can get access to over $6,000 worth of filmmaking courses from absolute pros that only get more and more valuable as they continue to add new classes. You can get camera courses produced by Ari, yes, the people that make the same cameras that we're talking about in this episode. Plus, MZ also offers exclusive membership discounts and offers to filmmaking essentials like Vimeo Plus or say b &H Photo Video. We highly recommend MZ Pro also to all aspiring filmmakers. So check out MZ Pro today, get 20% off on a year long membership. I go into the link in the description down below. That's something like under $20 a month for premium content. So thank you again to MZ Pro for sponsoring this episode. And now let's get back to the episode. In this scene, we see Rosie and Elsa in the hiding space. But it's an interesting, another interesting intimate moment between them. He's different, see? He suspects something. He thinks Inga's ghost lives up here. You remind me of her. You really do. I would love to have seen her grow into a woman. But I'll, I'll have to watch you instead. Basically, it's supposed to be a, a tiny attic space, so we didn't want to overbuild it, but also like we wanted to have enough room for for them to interact, to interact and, and stay there somehow. Like I tend to 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 like certain tools, and Vantage has a set of T ones. Mm -hmm. So my first conversation with Taika was like, okay, what do you think? The lighting source would be for for those scenes. Would she have like a candle or a, like a petrol lamp? So we went for the idea of the of the petrol lamp. Yeah. Then of course, like in my mind, it was like there are T1. Yeah. In theory, so I can shoot wide open, very linear, right? Yeah. And Taika was like, okay, let's go for it. So our key light in this scene, like if you go to the wide shot, that petrol lamp there, top left. Okay. That's the key light. Is that the actual light? Yeah. That's actually lighting them? Yeah. Are you kidding me? Yeah, that's, that's the T1. The tricky part with those petrol lamps is that if you want a bigger flame, you get more light out of it, but it smokes the glass very fast. So yeah. once every 10 minutes you have to clean the glass. So I was like, okay, let, where can we keep it? So it will give us the level of exposure. And then we had a really tiny LED tube yeah. for some fill light. And yeah. the little tube, what, it's probably like a two foot quasar or something? Like no, it's or like a Kino know, or a like little... A handmade thing out of uh, LED ribbon. So this is literally just yeah. like a, it had to be, a handmade it had to LED dim, thing. Yeah, and it had to be dimmed down quite a lot. Now, the down part of this, and it's like, if you look at it, especially for this scene, I tested only three lenses, and we realized that some of them weren't resolving up to 1.8. So there was a fair amount of sharpness that we had to do for this scene. Did you shoot all these close-ups wide open too? Yeah. Yeah, but that's the thing, like the 90 mil spherical T1 T T yeah. is actually resolving at 1, 1 1.2. For the ones that you had to go to 1.6, or if you had to leave it wide open, just a little bit of post sharpening to yeah, kind of fix yeah. it. Yeah, which is like sometimes you do just the eyes, sometimes you do, you yeah. there are better trees. Like if you do an overall sharpening, then it won't look right. For these close-ups, I mean, yeah. there's they, they move a little bit. And yeah. uh, if you're shooting it's wide very open. very tricky. So this was the other, like, the, the bedroom and we actually had there was a window here and another door here and we're talking about like when this would happen nothing like no other practical would be on so mm -hmm. the only thing would be probably some moonlight. Moonlight. Just, a, just a sky panel here like an s60 with a chimera like shooting through the door for this shot for scarlet for example we actually end up we were here we actually took this lamp and moved it here so we had like an edge light on the horror from the lamp oh the so this light way instead of it being here and too flat too flat and front lit we just moved around you just moved it around the same light source but i think there's you know? so many times where i yeah. think dps will look at it and be like i can't mess with continuity i have to leave this lamp here which means that her single is going to look great but her single is going to look kind of dumpy but you're saying you don't have to compromise you can like trust that you can you can 
you can get away Cheat with it. Cheat and that the audience will go along with it. And with great it. acting, you can get away with so hey. much. <laughs> this is the true real wrestling of the episode. Yeah. <laughs> Alrighty, let's move to this last and final oh. scene. You ready for this? Here we go. This is the end of uh, of the um, the war scene where Jojo's trying to desperate trying to place to hide. What's going on in this shot? It's it took a while. I mean, I think it took us five or six takes to get it right. It, it was such an interesting location and we wanted to do so much more to it. This was an abandoned factory. We we spoke about this shot and it was maybe we do it in one shot. And then I tend to like all these crazy ideas and then it was like, okay, now, now how are we gonna do that? Because in theory, like the easiest, and if you have the budget, you just bring a techno crane here and you just like, Go. Okay. Yeah, you, you just telescope back the entire way. Telescope back, you can boom down. The problem is that there was no way we can fit a techno there. For this one, I had to use actually two monitors because at our number one position, the camera was too high up. It was dollying this way, and when Jojo was jumping into the hole there, in our number two, it was too low. So then the hardest was to just boom in the same time as just, he was jumping. You gotta follow the gravity. And on top of all that, you add four, five explosions. <laughs> Yeah, and there's just, one, there's definitely two yeah, here, yeah. there's a third one here. And the crazy part is that the reset, because of the explosion, was taking like 25, 30 minutes. I think by take two, I almost lost hope. By take three, I was like, oh, 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 we, it's kind of we working. gain a little it's bit kind of happening It's kind here. of working. Yeah. Okay, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about the lighting. So first scene like this, here, what are you adding it, in? It, it wasn't too much. And actually we had a little bit of a sun. I think we had only two counters on this side mm -hmm. with, uh, I think it was one Airy Max here and one M90 here. Mm -hmm. I see those lights now. So that, that yeah, that's the, M90 is creating those M90. beams of light there. Yeah. It was one of those days where the sun was in and out. So I think we had our, our lights just in case the sun goes out. And the only thing that they would do there would probably be just lighting the smoke more than anything uh, else because it was a pretty pretty big distance so you're talking about just like kind of backlighting side lighting that smoke right yeah there. pretty much like especially for the big explosion yeah when you see that like you you just get a little more texture just so you see so it's not falling smoke. into darkness yeah and i think we had another uh two lights rigged inside these rooms like really high up pointing straight down i think they were like uh, uh just s60s yeah on a, on a polecat in both rooms it was pretty interesting because we kept working on it and taika was running to the second unit and i was like kind of running in between them. <laughs> but it was yeah it was a struggle like when we finally got it it was like oh okay, yes, yes. Thank you so much for joining us, Mihai. This was amazing. Can, no you, please sign? can you sign the, the <laughs> photo if you can? <laughs> also, thanks again to MZ for sponsoring this video. Make sure to check out the service in the link down below, along with links to the podcast discussion with Mihai, for those of you that want to learn more about his journey becoming a cinematographer. Awesome. So there's our episode with Mihai Malamari uh, on Jojo Rabbit. Amazing cinematography. Seriously, really, really good work on this. Thanks so much for watching this, guys. And of course, this is Indie Mobile. <laughs> No, so what, what did it cost back then for a hawk and a morphic lens? I mean, it, it was, I mean, just the fact that you had to bring them from another country, like to yeah. Romania, and that was like, oh no, you could forget okay. about it. That's not yeah. going to happen. We never really, I mean, we were like, just like watching photos in magazines with like Panavision on a morphic glass. And we're like, oh no, I mean, we <laughs> cannot even dream about those. You know, it's like, but our dream was like, oh, one day I wish I can use the hawk.